In this video, we're going to look at how we can use the Laplace transform to analyze LCR filters. There are a few goals of this video. We're going to find the transfer function of the LCR filter by analyzing the schematic diagram. We're going to find and interpret the poles of the transfer function H of S. And finally, we're going to find the differential equation that describes the filter. So just a, a little bit of review here. A filter's transfer function, H of S, um, can be thought of, if we, if we think of the uh, LCR filter as an LTI system, we have an input coming into the filter, which is the input voltage. Um, specifically, in, in this case, we have an AC phasor voltage coming in with some frequency. And then the output of the filter, the output voltage is also uh, a voltage phasor but it's given by the transfer function H of S multiplied by the input voltage V sub I. So the transfer function, the definition of a transfer function is the output divided by the input when we're working here in the frequency domain. And we're gonna see how we can find this very uh, relatively simply by using a voltage divider rule when we look at the circuit um, shortly. All right, so um, the first thing we're going to have to do uh, before we get to our example is we're going to have to uh, basically convert the circuit elements in the, in the uh, schematic diagram. In other words, the resistance, uh, the capacitor, and uh, the inductor. We're going to replace those circuit elements with their Laplace transform impedances. So I'm not going to derive these results here. Um, it's actually shown in the lecture notes. But um, the, it's, uh, the results are fairly simple. We take a, a resistor, R, and it uh, just becomes R in the frequency domain as well. So nothing really special there. For capacitance, C, we replace it with its Laplace transform impedance, which is one over S times C. And then for the inductor, L, its impedance becomes S times L. All right, so let's look at an example to see how this is done. So in this particular example, we're given um, the circuit diagram here of an LRC low pass filter. So we've got a uh, resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor configured like this. The input uh, voltage is over here, and the output is taken here um, at the capacitor. So the first step of the process is to replace the circuit elements with their corresponding impedances. So remember that R just becomes R, L becomes S times L, and C becomes one over SC. So this is the equivalent circuit in the frequency domain uh, using impedances. Now we can write the transfer function H of S by using the voltage divider rule. Now this is something we've covered in previous lecture notes, so I'm not gonna go over the details here, but it's actually quite simple. Whenever we have a voltage divider circuit like this, where the voltage is split between different parts of the circuit, H of S, or in, in other words, the output divided by the input, is given by the impedance in this lower leg here, which is one over SC, divided by the sum of all the impedances. So on top, we have one over SC, you can see that here. And in the denominator, we add R, with SL and one over SC. And so by using the voltage divider rule, you can see we can put the transfer function, we can write it directly. At this point, we can clean it up a little bit. Notice we have some fractions inside of fractions here. So if we go ahead and multiply all the terms through by SC, we can get rid of those fractions. And we end up with one over SRC plus S squared LC plus one. And this is, a, uh, this is the transfer function for this LRC low pass filter. We can do a little bit more here. We can rewrite it in a form that's very convenient. Um, for example, if we divide top and bottom of this result by LC, so on the top we get one over LC, and on the bottom uh, we get, notice this S squared term has the LC in it, so that just becomes S squared. Um, and then we have plus S times R over L plus one over LC. Now, the reason we do this is because now we can use the 
uh, circuit's natural frequency, omega naught, which is one over root LC. So by replacing all these, we have one over LC here, we have one over LC there. Well, that's just omega naught squared. So that sort of cleans up those fractions again. And this is another uh, convenient form to write the transfer function in. And this is the one we're going to use going forward. The next thing we can do is find the poles of this transfer function. So here we're going to, we have our transfer function that we just determined from the previous slide, h of s. And what we can do here to find the poles, remember we have to find the roots of the denominator. That determines the poles of the transfer function. So usually um, this is not something that you can um, ever factor in your head using trial and error. Instead, we're going to use the quadratic formula um, in order to factor this into its two terms. So I'm going to rewrite this as s minus p sub 1 times s minus p sub 2, where p1 and p2 are the two poles of this filter or this transfer function. And again, we get the, the uh, result here by using the quadratic formula. So um, we end up with uh, this formula here for the two poles. We have negative r over 2l plus or minus j, because these, uh, uh, in almost all cases here, uh, we're going to end up with a complex uh, poles here. So we're going to, in this case, we have omega naught squared root omega naught squared minus r over 2l all squared. All right, so the way to interpret this is remember that poles are plotted in the complex s-plane here. So poles have a real part, sigma, and an imaginary part, j omega. So this first part out in front here, the minus r over 2l, that is the sigma. That determines where the pole is along the horizontal axis of the s-plane. On the other hand, the stuff inside, or the stuff after the j, that's our omega, all right? Because we have plus or minus j omega here. And so um, this uh, term here with the uh, square root and everything inside of it, that determines the frequency of the pole, and that determines where the pole is in the vertical direction along the j omega axis. So by actually plugging in numbers for r and l and omega naught into this formula, we could plot the two poles. And in this case, um, you can see there are complex poles and they will be complex conjugates of each other. Now we can do a little more here. Uh, by making this pole zero ROC plot, remember that a filter, like any electronic circuit, has to be causal. So one of the rules is the ROC, or region of convergence for a causal system, has its ROC to the right of the poles. Right, to the right of the rightmost pole. So um, what we can do then is shade everything here to, on the right of our two poles, P1 and P2. And the other thing, notice, is that the region of convergence includes the J omega axis, and that's a good thing because that tells us that our filter is stable. Now let's take a look at those poles a little bit more and look at the physical interpretation of what these poles mean. So remember what we're doing here is we're plotting the two poles. I've got one here and one down here. And remember that sigma is, uh, you can get it from our result here, it's negative r over 2l. So we, we see that it is a negative number uh, because of that minus sign there. And that puts it over here in the left half plane. Um, we also remember we're plotting omega, the frequency of the pole, is um, everything to the right of the j here, because we have j omega. So this, uh, whatever value this ends up being here, the square root of all this stuff inside here, that determines the frequency of the pole here, right? And so that's how we can plot the pole. Now, what, what does this frequency mean? Well, it turns out that um, if we remember that the uh, transfer function, h of s, is the Laplace transform of the impulse response of the filter. Or another way of saying this, the filter's impulse response is the inverse Laplace transform of the transfer function h of s. And um, in my lecture notes, I show how to, do, how to derive this and prove this, but it turns out that the impulse response 
ends up having the form of e to the sigma t times sine of omega t. All right, so let's look at these uh, terms and see what they mean. Well, sigma shows up here in the exponent of a real exponential function. This is sigma here. Remember that sigma is a negative number. So that means our impulse response has a impulse, I'm sorry, an exponential function with a negative exponent as a function of time. This means it is a decaying exponential function. It's going to decay to zero with time. And that again is because this is a stable filter. And that's one of the uh, characterizations of a stable system is that its impulse response will decay to zero. <laughs> so that's what uh, sigma tells us is how fast that impulse response decays. And it depends on you know, R or the ratio of R to L. Notice that the impulse response also oscillates. It has a sign term. And the frequency at which it oscillates or rings is omega. And omega is given by this second part of the pole here. This is the uh, imaginary part of the pole gives us the frequency of the impulse response. And that's plotted here on the vertical axis. All right, now, it also turns out that the distance from the origin in the S-plane to the pole is omega naught. And omega naught is, of course, the natural frequency of this filter given by one over root LC. So we have these three different parameters here. We have omega, sigma, and omega naught. Um, they're each, they each have a physical interpretation that we just discussed. And there's one other sort of interesting relationship between these three. Notice that um, this forms a right triangle here. So if I'd redraw this right triangle down here, the hypotenuse is omega naught, which is the natural frequency. And this leg of the right triangle down here is sigma, which is the real part of the pole. That determines how fast the impulse response decays. And then the height here of the triangle is omega, which determines the frequency at which the impulse response oscillates. And these, uh, again, these three, because of the right triangle here, uh, they are related by the Pythagorean theorem. We can see that sigma squared plus omega squared is equal to the hypotenuse squared, omega naught squared. The final task here is to find the low pass filters differential equation. Um, there's an easy way and a hard way to do this. The hard way to do it would be to work in the time domain. And starting, you know, going back to our original circuit in this example, uh, we could use the, the traditional or conventional techniques of using, for example, Ohm's law for the resistor. Uh, for the inductor, we have the voltage across the inductor is equal to L times di dt. And then the uh, current through the capacitor, IC, is equal to C times dv dt. And we can, you know, use the uh, Kirchhoff's voltage law and, and so forth and come up with a differential equation to describe the circuit. But it's a bit, of, I mean, it's a little messy and it requires several steps. There's a much easier way to do this since we've already done the work to find the transfer function H of S. I've shown it here. Um, this is the same one that we uh, derived earlier a couple slides ago. We can simply write the differential equation for this transfer function by inspection using the methods that we've learned um, in previous videos. So for example, for this transfer function here, we can look at the numerator. Remember the numerator tells us what goes on the right side of the differential equation. Omega naught squared is just a constant. So we have omega naught squared times x on the right side. For the denominator, this determines what's on the left side of the differential equation. So s squared, remember, gives us a second derivative in y. S gives us a first derivative in y, dy dt. And of course, it's multiplied here by the coefficient r over l. And then finally, we have again, the constant term omega naught squared, which gives us omega naught squared times y. So just by inspection, we can write the differential equation in terms of x's and y's um, in one quick step. Um, the last thing we have to do here is remember that um, X is our input voltage and Y is our output voltage. So wherever we see a Y here, we replace it with V out. Here's uh, dy dt becomes dv out dt. 
and y becomes v out. And then here is the x here. We replace that with the input v sub i. And this is our differential equation for this low-pass LCR filter.